I wish I could be a filmmaker like Chris Nolan. He's like, I'm making Oppenheimer. And I'm like, I'm making the third iteration of something I did when I was in my 20s. got to do a reading of that original version of Clerks 3 when we did a benefit for the First Avenue Playhouse in Atlantic Islands, which is where we did auditions for Clerks years ago and where we went back and reshot the audition sequence in Clerks 3. So when we did this benefit, we did a reading of that script of Clerks 3 and it was incredibly cathartic and it got all the reaction that I was hoping for. And that was enough for that version of the story. That story was written by a guy who was obsessed with death who had no idea what death was. And then I had the fucking heart attack and then I learned what death really is. And so that version of Clerks 3 was very King Lear, everything breaking down. Um, this version is more uh, celebratory. It's more joyous. And, you know, I realized after our reading, as much as I love that script, I was like, if you walked into Clerks 3 and that was the movie, you'd be like, I don't think he understood the first Clerks or even the second Clerks. Um, so changing it was not a problem. It also felt cursed to some degree because we hadn't been able to make it for like five, seven years or something. And then I was thinking about after the heart attack, um, doing a movie where like I was just gonna play me going back to work at the quick stop um, and trying to recreate the situation through which Clerks was created. Like I get my friend Brian Johnson to come work and do a quasi documentary or something. And then I was like, wait, no, this would just be better if I did it through, the, through Dante and Randall and gave Randall my heart attack um, and let him go on the journey of making Clerks and, and bringing it in a weird way full circle. Dante and Randall have given me everything in life. So it felt like Maybe I give them the same shot they gave me. It's like, now you guys get to make a movie. And it was easy to write, obviously, because like I lived through Clerks and I lived through the heart attack. And I've been doing Clerks material for years on stage, so I know what works and what's funny. And I've been doing heart attack material for the last four years on stage, so I know what parts of it work and are funny and communicatable and stuff. So writing it was a joy. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say it was necessarily therapeutic where I was like, ah, but I'm a real manufacturer for use kind of person. So if it happens and you could use it, fucking use it, especially if it's a bad thing that happens. Nearly dying, having a heart attack, mass widow maker is a bad thing. But if you could take it, repurpose it into something kind of fucking useful and shit, then suddenly you depower it from what it was and turn it into power in a different way altogether. So it's weird, when I watch the movie, I'm completely divorced from the fact that I was like, oh shit, that all happened to me, like word for word and stuff. Now the heart attack belongs to Randall. What the hell is this? I added a scene where you get shot. I'm not letting you kill me off in the third act. What if there's a sequel? A sequel? What am I, a hack? What's a great question. Um, I think when I started the journey, I was, I know for a fact I was Dante. The character of Dante is based on me. Uh, you know, it's, that was my life working a quick stop. Randall was based on Brian Johnson, who I most wanted to be in life. Far more free than I was and stuff. It could say whatever the fuck he wants. It didn't worry about repercussion, just he was Randall. So I wrote the role of Randall to play myself, which is why Randall has all the best jokes. But the closer we got to making it, I was like, what the fuck am I thinking? I'm no actor. I can't memorize all this dialogue. Who wrote this shit? So I looked for somebody else, Jeff Anderson, who I went to high school with, he read the script with me and I was like, you're fucking the voice, you got the voice, you be this guy. And then I at least wanted to be in the movie so I picked Silent Bob so I didn't have to memorize dialogue and I still got to be in the flick. So in reworking the whole thing, um, you know, in terms of I've started as Dante but by the time you get to Clerks 3, the story thrust is put on Randall's shoulders and the thing that happened to me which technically should have happened to Dante if we're following the rules of these movies, if there are indeed any, um, suddenly you're like, wait, why fucking Randall? For me, the filmmaker, it's like a, a weirdly personal triumph because I've spent my whole life trying to become Randall and at least in the movie, I do finally get to become Randall in some weird way. It also just didn't feel like something Dante would do and that's where me and the character differ. You know, like if Dante is indeed based on me and he indeed was, it stopped being me such a long time ago. Like Dante would have never made Clerks. You know, he's a shitter, get off the pot kind of guy. He's a, he's a, I mean, we, we heard what happened in Clerks. Randall 
has nothing to lose. He's got no love, no family, no life outside the quick stop. He's just led a, you know, a nonstop existence of like sniping and cynicism and shit like that. And he got to own his own store, but perhaps doesn't feel quite as fulfilled. So I, you know, that's both of those feelings are anathema to me. And as much as like I've been fulfilled for a long time now, because I get to make the movies I want to tell the stories I want to. It was nice to empower these cats, but it just didn't feel like Dante was ever going to be that engine. I wouldn't have bought that personally, and I'm a big Clerks fan. But if it was Dante making the movie, I'd be like, I don't see it. Which is weird because the guy that Dante's based on did go off and make a movie and stuff. But I always look at this as like, well, this is what would have happened if Clerks didn't happen. Like life would have went on in this way and stuff. So you chart a fictional version of your existence um which is you know i wish i could be a filmmaker like chris nolan he's like i'm making oppenheimer and i'm like i'm making the third iteration of something i did when i was in my 20s but you know there's a trick to that too as much as it's like well that doesn't sound very ambitious it's like you try it you know how many fucking ducks in a row you got to set up to make a clerk's three fall just the right way it's a, a job that started 29 years ago so i know some people are like it's just another clerk's three but i'm like all right like, I'm not saying go make a movie, but I'm saying think about how difficult that is to pull off. When you started with this like shitty little black and white movie made in the back woods of New Jersey that probably nobody was going to see. And here we stand on the threshold of like a trilogy. You know, I, I loved Richard Linklater. He was the filmmaker that made me want to make Clerks because I saw Slacker. And he had an indie film trilogy, you know, with the before series. And I feel like I'm breathing rarefied air to be kind of right up there with him did, did robert ever get to a trilogy at el mariachi yes he did el mariachi desperado and once upon a time uh, in mexico so look i'll never be as good as robert or or as richard but in that weird small way i share a little bit of real estate with him no i'm not that patient like richard's a true filmmaker born to be a filmmaker put on this earth to make film i think i was born to watch movies and i got very lucky because like i'm gonna try to make one and it just kind of fucking worked out for me but he's the kind of guy he's visionary he thinks about shit like that that would have never occurred to me in a million years like what i'm more about instant gratification you shoot the movie and then get it out there as quickly as possible he had the patience to be like i'm just gonna shoot a little bit over time and it really panned out like he was awarded and rewarded by art and, and pop culture in general because it captured everybody's imagination watching the, the kid grow up on camera and we don't clearly we can't pull it off in clerks 3 but there are moments in clerks 3 where we have what we call our boyhood moments where you see our characters from the beginning all the way to the present and you have this weird feeling of like i've grown up with these fuckers man i don't think so i think uh, now in the age of TikTok, it's much easier to get the idea across that like this job sucks with a 30 second video there's a guy if i was truly making a sequel to clerks today there's a guy whose name escapes me and i gotta learn it he's wonderful uh my wife loves him and she's always like watch this fucking video and she's never that person he's a guy who does these ikea videos where he's like got a mustache and he pretends to be the person bitching at ikea and then he dramatically brings the camera close to himself the music shifts and he comments back as the person that works in the store. It is brilliantly funny, very fucking short, biting as fuck. And if I was making Clerks today, that's what I would do. I would never occur to me to make a whole fucking narrative, like 90 minutes in a convenience store, when you could just do a series of fucking bitching at the camera videos, which are devastatingly funny. I think if TikTok existed, if Instagram existed, if, if the internet existed when I made, right before I made Clerks, I don't think I would have tried to make Clerks because I would not have felt talented. Because when you turn on the internet, like, yeah, it's a hate machine and yeah, it's divisive and there's a lot of shit that comes along with it, but it is a window into how many creative, inventive, and talented people are out there, man, in big and small ways. And, you know, like making a movie, uh, making something 90 minutes is. You're lucky if you get to do it, but could you imagine saying the same thing in 30 seconds? Like, that's truly a gifted storyteller. You can get that across far more often and to far more people at a shorter range of time. So if I did the mental math, like if I was trying to make Clerks today, I'd look at the odds against me. Number one, like movie distribution doesn't exist in the same way it has pre predominantly existed throughout most of my life. Since I'm not making a Marvel movie or a fucking Tom Cruise movie, I wouldn't even know if I would get a berth in the cinemas any place. 
And I'm certainly not going to get picked up by Netflix because they pump money into uh, filmmakers from all around the world to make high-end looking product. They're not necessarily in the acquisition business. So of, of small uh, guerrilla made films. So at that point, like my options would be incredibly limited. Honestly, I'd probably think about doing, if I was doing a whole feature, I'd do it as an NFT because at least there's a dedicated marketplace there where people believe in it and stuff. We did that with Kilroy was here just recently. But I don't think I'd ever think about making Clerks as a narrative in this day and age, particularly if I had to spend any time on the internet. I would be so intimidated by how much funnier, how, how, how much smarter, you know, how much more talented people are that I'd probably just put the idea aside and be like, you know what, who do you think you could do this kind of thing? So thank God that voice, those voices didn't exist when I was kind of getting started. Well, we've talked about, you know, are you Dante or are you Randall? You are also Silent Bob. And I did read a quote uh, that you said around the time Clerks 2 came out. And you were always open to revisiting Dante and Randall. Mm. And you, but you said, if I'm 40 years old and I'm still wearing a backwards baseball cap, somebody shoot me. Yeah. Well, 51. More, you going to be 52 next month. Exactly. You said you, <laughs> specifically, you said, I don't really want to revisit them necessarily in their 40s because how sad would it be for them to still be hanging out by the quick stop? Look at how sad it is. <laughs> yeah, we found a way to go back to Jay and Silent Bob in a, that, you know, I love Jay and Silent Bob reboot, but in Clerks 3, they're used, uh, this is rather self-serving, but I feel they're used the best they've ever been used in a Kevin Smith movie. Like, expert, deft use of the characters. Just enough, they never overstay their welcome, and every time they're on screen, they do something funny. It's, it, it's reminiscent of them in Clerks, but a funnier version of them. Because Jason Mewes, when we made Clerks, he was a kid, had never acted before. He's like basically a human puppet with my hand up his ass going, snooch to the nooch. Now, he's a brilliant fucking statesman, of elder statesman of comedy, a raconteur, who can hold his own and be very funny and stuff without my help necessarily. So he aged into that character well enough where I could kind of keep them going and stuff. Uh, but if anyone's like, yeah, right, it's for the money, trust me, kids. Which camera? That one? Trust me, kids. There's no money in Jay and Silent Bob movies. <laughs> Take it from Silent Bob himself. What there is is a lot of fun. You get to do what you want. You get to tell these goofy stories. You get to make like a series of movies set in a weird universe. You get to make t-shirts and tchotchkes, you know, not worldwide, but just enough to sell to some fans, make you feel like, holy shit, like we did a thing. It existed. And somebody wearing a shirt of it, you're like, must have happened. They're wearing a goddamn shirt. So it's all the little joys that come along with it, man. But it's certainly not the like, well, this will pay my mortgage. No, I pay my mortgage by sitting around and talking about Jay and Silent Bob and the movies and stuff. Like I, that's prim pr primarily how I make my nut in this world is, is standing on stage and talking about all the things that I do rather than doing the things that I do. Isn't that fucked up and beautiful? Like at least I'm making money in some way, but it's not the thing you would think. Like most people are like, oh, you're in the movie business, you must be rich. I'm like, not the Kevin Smith movie business. No, it's fulfilling, but it's not enriching. <laughs> By any stretch of the imagination.